There you go. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, hopefully, we're able to provide some helpful information to everyone tonight. My name is AJ Sickman. I'm a partner in the BBFCS law firm. Uh, I'm also the city attorney, and then I sit on the board as the vice president of the um, Pro, Bono, Pro Bono Foundation uh, here in Richmond. And so uh, my practice has a real estate component to it. I run into real estate issues through my work with the city, and then the Pro Bono Foundation deals with a lot of landlord-tenant issues, and we consult about those and try to help uh, community members in that regard as well. Uh, to my right, your left, is Keon Jackson. He's the director of the Housing Authority, so we thought it would be a great idea to get him in to talk from that perspective. So he's going to do that after I go through uh, a few matters pertaining to real estate law. So uh, this is informal, uh, want to be conversational. So I, you know, I have a slide at the end with questions, but if you have questions or going through it, just let me know uh, and we can talk through whatever questions you may have. And apparently I got out of my slideshow somehow. There we go. So we're going to talk about four topics today, the first of which are some tips for tenants. Um, I've been practicing law now for uh, just under 12 years and do a lot of landlord uh, tenant work. Um, and so I've put together um, some what I feel are helpful uh, tips uh, as you're negotiating leases, you're getting involved uh, early on with the landlord and then on the back end too when you're uh, leaving a residence. <clears throat> um, first tip, I'm actually going to come over here. The security deposit, I say that they're often required. Uh, I've never reviewed a lease that didn't require one, um, but it's not to say that they have to have them, but most landlords uh, like to have that security. Um, so a couple tips uh, that I found to be helpful when you're talking about the security deposit is that um, you should require a few things. Uh, get a receipt that shows the amount that you paid, the date of the payment, uh, what the intended use of the payment is, because as you're going to see a little bit later, um, it could be security for last month's rent, uh, or it could be security for damages or a blend or combination of the two. So if landlord is not securing last month's rent and your lease agreement says this is really for any damages that may result as uh, my occup uh, occupancy of the premises, and then there could be an argument down the road that landlord's not really entitled to keep monies uh, for purposes not set forth within the, the lease agreement. Uh, obviously, get the name of the person receiving that deposit and get the landlord to sign off saying, yep, I received it uh, and you're good to go. Uh, Another tip before renting, this is kind of common sense, but examine the property, take photos. Um, you know, I uh, analogize this to when I get a rental car. Every time I do, my wife thinks I'm crazy, but I go a 360 and I take photos of the whole thing because I don't want that coming back on me that I did something while it was in my possession. Same thing uh, for any property that you're leasing. Um, check your lease provisions for anything that may uh, pertain to abatement of rent or self-help with reimbursement. Go ahead. Uh, someone once told me that it's better to take photos with a regular camera instead of a digital camera because that may hold up better in court. Is that accurate or not? There's a procedure for authenticating evidence in court, so if it's on a cell phone, um, the court's going to tell you, hey, if you bring in your cell phone and show it to me as, th as though this is evidence, it really isn't, I have to take the phone from you. So that's a kind of a common pitfall for people when they're in that situation. So my advice is, it doesn't matter what type of device you take it on, just print it, uh, and then you have to go through the process of authenticating the photos. So, Your Honor, I took this photo on this date with this phone, uh, it's a true and accurate depiction of that which I took a photograph on on this date and typically if you hit those three elements that's good enough to get through the evidentiary burden but great question yeah uh, rent abatement or self-help I'm going to talk about rent abatement a little bit further in the slideshow and you're going to see that that's not something that's available to Indiana residents um, but it's something that can be negotiated of course landlords uh, aren't going to be exactly receptive to that knowing that the law doesn't require them to do that uh, but I also talk when I'm negotiating leases about well, landlord, if the water heater goes out and you tell me it's going to be seven days before you can get here to fix it and I can get someone over tomorrow to get this done and it's going to cost me $200, I want to have the right to do that and then you would have to reimburse me so long as that expense is reasonable. Um, so that's something just within the last few years I've been negotiating on behalf of my uh, tenant clients. <clears throat> as far as the security deposit is concerned, I, I see this all the time. Uh, people move out and landlord says, well, you paid $1,000 in security deposit. After I went through and checked everything, it came out to just about $1,000. So that's what I'm going to keep. Uh, well, no, that, that shouldn't be the case. If you're paid in rent and there aren't significant 
uh, visible damages to the property, uh, then the landlord needs to return that security deposit. Uh, there's a statute that talks about normal wear and tear. I cited it there. It's 323176. Um, and there's case law that examines it that says, you know, carpets aren't going to look the same. Uh, the walls aren't going to look quite the same. We're talking about normal wear and tear stuff. Landlord doesn't get to keep uh, deposits for that purpose. Uh, and I've actually litigated those in small claims. Uh, and in my experience, small claims courts uh, try to be tenant friendly because they understand that there are going to be uh, those issues, normal issues that develop over a period of a year uh, or more. <clears throat> Landlord must return the deposit less amount taken for rent due, damages, and I pointed or added this because I thought it was important, and or unpaid utility or sewer charges that the tenant's obligated to pay. Um, and then another uh, kind of practice tip is that the landlord has to itemize the amount that's due under the security deposit that he or she alleges is due within 45 days of the termination of your lease. If they don't do that in writing uh, to your uh, address that you provide, the new address you provided to the landlord, uh, then you're entitled to keep the entire deposit. Uh, utilities, this one actually comes up uh, more so in my capacity of representing the city. So first of all, you got to decide who pays, uh, and that's an obvious question that you're going to ask. Some landlords will pay that. Other landlords say, nope, you need to sign that up into your own name. Uh, but let's say the lease requires the tenant to pay and the tenant fails to pay. Who's responsible? Uh, well, ultimately, you made an obligation, a promise to your landlord through the lease that you would pay the utilities. So that privity of contract is between those two parties. But the utility company says property is owned by landlord, landlord is ultimately responsible. So it can create issues when they file a lien and landlord says they're supposed to pay uh, and tenant is out in the wind somewhere. And so you can imagine that that does create some issues. So those are conversations uh, that are worth having with the landlord up front. So both parties understand the rights and responsibilities going into it uh, as it relates to utilities. Another issue that uh, I've had come up that I thought was important to discuss is can the landlord shut off my utilities? I've seen it more times uh, than I care to share. Uh, someone comes to me and says, uh, you know, I have a, a three-year-old daughter. Uh, I have no heat. I have no water. Um, well, Indiana Code, I cited there, 322156, <clears throat> says that except is authorized by a judicial order, so a court order, a landlord may not deny or interfere with the tenant's access to or possession of a dwelling unit by interrupting, reducing, or shutting off electricity, gas, water, or other essential services. Uh, now, that's only true if the tenant hasn't, quote, abandoned the dwelling unit. Um, and so uh, if you know, the landlord can determine reasonably that you've left, well, okay, the, 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 the problem is no longer there and they can shut off water or other utilities. But if you're there, notwithstanding the fact that you may not have paid rent in three months, it's the landlord's obligation uh, to get that judicial order for eviction so that they can turn off those utilities. Uh, inspections, this is another one I get calls on, you know, a landlord just showed up and I'm in the middle of uh, my kid's birthday party and it's really become uh, an inconvenience because he or she is doing this frequently. Um, well, th there's a statute that says landlord can't abuse the right of entry uh, or uh, to harass a tenant. You have the right of peaceful enjoyment. Um, the landlord has to give reasonable written or oral, oral notice um, and oftentimes uh, that will be specified in the lease and usually we put in 24 hours notice and then it also has to be at reasonable times. Obviously uh, 2 a.m. doesn't make a lot of sense to bang on your door and say I, I want to go through and inspect the premises. Um, if there's an emergency exists that hey this is a threat to the tenants uh, life or property or the landlord's property then they have the right under Indiana law to just come in and say hey we have to address this uh, right now. <clears throat> Uh, next topic was the warranty of habitability, um, also something that comes up. Um, so there's a code section that I cite there that says the landlord has to deliver the premises in a safe, clean, and habitable condition. Uh, so what does that mean? Because it, it, that's sort of a, a generalized definition. Uh, well, Indiana law tells us what it means. Uh, first, it has to comply with all health and housing codes. Second, make all reasonable efforts to keep common areas in a clean and proper condition. Uh, and then the landlord also has to ensure uh, safe working condition uh, of electrical systems, plumbing systems, and ensure there's hot and cold water, sanitary systems, HVAC, sufficient to supply heat at all times, uh, elevators have to be maintained if provided. Uh, and then um, I actually learned about this one as I was doing a little bit further research, I haven't had it come up, but supplied appliances that were an inducement to the lease agreement. So if landlord advertises, hey, we have a stove and a refrigerator, washer and dryer, and it, it's part of the premises, and that'll be a part 
party or lease, uh, washer goes out, landlord has an obligation to fix it. That's under the uh, warranty of habitability. So I'd, um, I assume that if that's something that I didn't really know after uh, practicing law in this area, that a lot of people wouldn't. So I thought that was a good tip. Um, what constitutes a breach? Um, and, and, uh, these are conversations too that I have a lot. I mean, when is that line crossed? Um, and so litigation uh, guides us. And so I found a video that I thought was helpful that kind of describes if I can figure out how to play it. Maybe not. Well, I'll see if I can come back to it at the end. But uh, essentially, it was a town in Rhode Island, and there was an investigative reporter that did a piece. Um, and they go through, and they look at this apartment building, and they describe uh, all of the different violations that exist there. So we're not talking about, hey, <clears throat> paint's chipping off the wall on the exterior. Um, my carpet's not very nice. It kind of has an odor to it. <clears throat> That's not breaching the, the warranty of habitability. Uh, these are things like <clears throat> we find roaches everywhere, and they won't bring in someone to address that problem. Um, we have uh, toilets that are broken. Um, we were without heat for three days. Um, things that you need to reasonably have in place to, to live, right? Just at the bare minimum comfort level. Um, and so this, and I'll get into another case in a moment, actually resulted uh, in a lawsuit. And so I went to Indiana and I thought, well, let's, let's see what's out there. And, and Keon's going to cringe at this because it was filed against the housing authority, but it was South Bend, not Richmond. Richmond does a great job. He's going to tell you about that in a minute. Uh, but the, this case was a group of uh, plaintiffs that sued the housing authority of South Bend um, under uh, the warranty of habitability, and then there were some, also some other legal principles that I thought were important as we're talking about housing law. So the Fair Housing Act, American uh, with Disabilities Act, uh, and there were also civil rights violations that they allege existed. Um, so they sued and said, hey, they failed to meet the standards of habitability and peaceful enjoyment. And as I've kind of touched on earlier, these were things like broken and flooding toilets, roach infestations, broken AC, filthy carpet mold, open electrical sockets with exposed wires and dirty common areas. Additionally, the tenants were African American and had disabilities. Um, and I don't think I touched on this in the, or the next slide, but there was an elevator that they didn't maintain either, which caused them to have to um, traverse, I think, six flights of stairs to get to their apartment. Uh, which was really hard uh, for the husband in this case. So as I said, they sued under these various acts, and they alleged economic loss, loss of quiet enjoyment, apprehension, fear, worry, humiliation, and physical and mental impact. Um, and so I highlighted, this is uh, the actual case. Um, and so th these are important concepts to remember, because if you find yourself in a situation in which you feel like maybe this warranty of habitability uh, has been breached, it doesn't stop there. There are other legal concepts that are at play when you're in this context. So uh, under um, the Fair Housing Act and the ADA, it says it's protect people with disabilities from discrimination by a public entity, uh, which a housing authority is. Uh, it also provides no otherwise qualified individual with a disability in the United States shall solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from the participation in or be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance, which the housing authority did in that instance. Uh, ADA also talked about <clears throat> qualified individuals with a disability shall by reason of that disability uh, be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of services, programs, or activities of any public entity, or shall not, rather. Uh, and then Fair Housing Act or pro uh, prohibits discrimination in housing on the basis of disability uh, and that they say it is illegal. Um, and so that was the legal basis under which um, the plaintiffs brought their suit in the Smith case. Um, and just to save you a little bit of time, I kind of summarized it. The, the defendant filed a motion to dismiss, so they, they didn't even say to claim they shouldn't go to trial. Well, the federal court said, hey, these are cognizable claims, uh, those deficiencies that I just talked about. Uh, and then there was a second component that's important for tenants to understand, too. Um, they said, not only do they have a cognizable claim, they may not have pled this, they didn't say this, but we think there's a retaliation claim here as well. Uh, because the landlord tried to evict these tenants after they started making complaints. Uh, so there was an underlying small claim eviction suit, and they, the plaintiff said, yeah, we're going to remove this from small claims and we're going to go to federal court and we're going to talk about our complaints there. Uh, and so the federal court said, yeah, retaliation could be at play here, definitely illegal. Um, and so they allowed those claims to go forward. 
Um, as I said, they also um, said that the warranty of habitability was breached. The court said, yeah, you have enough evidence there uh, to move past that motion to dismiss as well. Also keep in mind, um, attorney's fees are prohibitive oftentimes to someone thinking that, hey, I, I can fight this. I, I, there has been an injustice here, but I don't have the resources to do it. Um, under that statute, you're entitled to reasonable attorney's fees if you're successful. Um, and so the court made sure it noted that as well within its opinion. Um, evictions was the third topic, um, so I kind of want to talk about what happens. Yeah, go ahead. Is the drug addiction considered a mental disability under the Smith law? Under uh, under the ADA, it can it can be considered a disability. Yep, and it, it, that that analysis can get fairly complex with uh, substances, whether it's drugs or alcohol. Uh, now, under the Smith case, in terms of uh, housing. I would have to look that up to find a particular case, but I know in the employment law realm, it's a topic of conversation. Yeah, good question. Yeah. In the state of Indiana, does a tenant ever have a right to withhold rent? I'm gonna, I, have a sli I have a slide on that. The answer is the answer's no, uh, but I, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about that further okay. in just a minute. Uh, rent, refusal or neglect to pay. If the tenant refuses or neglects when the rent's due, the landlord can, or landlord can terminate the lease with 10 days notice. Um, and so that 10 day notice um, oftentimes isn't complied with uh, by landlords. And so that, that's uh, an argument that you can make. You didn't do that. In fact, the statute gives you a little form and says this is what it should look like uh, for the landlords to give to you. Uh, here, if it's a Wayne County property, the landlord is going to, going to file it in the Wayne Superior Court 3 if the amount requested is less than 10000 The court's going to schedule an initial hearing. Uh, and at that point, uh, as the tenant, you're either going to admit that you're in violation of the lease and you're going to move out or you're going to deny that. If you deny, court schedules an actual eviction hearing at a later date. And that's the point when you want to be prepared with evidence, whether it's documentary, uh, witness, all, usually it's documentary. It's either you paid the rent or you didn't, so hopefully you have some evidence of that payment and it just wasn't a cash transaction. Um, but if the court orders the eviction, uh, the tenants provided a reasonable period of time to vacate, and then the court schedules a damages hearing, uh, and that is uh, the point in time when the landlord uh, tries to convince the court that he or she is entitled to damages and that the uh, defendant should be paying money as a result of any damage that they cause to the real estate. Uh, I, I thought this was important too about abandoned property because we've argued about this before. A, a landlord doesn't have liability for loss or damage to a tenant's personal property if it's been abandoned. Uh, and then there's um, some language about delivering that to a warehouseman, uh, basically a storage facility. There's a procedure that they have to go through. You have a question? Statute doesn't give a, a particular time frame, but at the damages hearing, typically, you know, while I'm representing the tenant, they may say, hey, they forced me out or I had the situation where they illegally turned off the water or whatever. I still have stuff in there. And so clearly that's not abandoned. And so usually it's just done by testimony uh, at some point in the hearing process. Now, if landlord says it's been a month and I have no contact from this person, <clears throat> then it's just a, a reasonableness analysis at that point, but, but no specific time frame set forth within that code section. All right, so your question, rent abatement. Uh, let's say the landlord breaches the lease, fails to comply with the warranty of habitability, or otherwise damages the tenant. I actually learned this the hard way in law school. I was in a big apartment complex and a pipe burst in a closet, uh, ruined a lot of stuff, and uh, then I uh, got behind the drywall and see that it had been dripping for a while and there's mold growing up uh, behind the drywall. It's pretty bad. Um, so me being a first year law student thought, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to get some of my money back. Um, and they had a, a longtime real estate lawyer that said, no, no, you can't abate the rent. You still have to pay. Um, I made enough noise that they ultimately did uh, let me not pay rent for one month, but it wasn't because I was illegally entitled to not pay rent. They were just working with me. Um, so in some states, you can deposit it into an escrow account until the dispute is resolved. Go ahead. I, don't, I tried to ask about escrow here in Wayne County, and I was told that they did not do that. Correct. So that, I'm just posing the question, can you do it? Answer is no. A lot of states you can. Uh, so I just did a little bit of research, um, and this Indy Star article really helped me. Only five states, including Indiana, have no statute allowing a tenant to withhold rent until necessary housing repairs are made, nor can renters pay for the repairs themselves and deduct the cost of the repairs from the next rent payment. Um, and so there's a quote here. We're definitely out of step with the vast majority of states.
gates and providing some sort of teeth to a mechanism to make sure tenants have a safe and habitable place uh, to live. And so it, it does create a problem when you can't do that. And apparently we're in the minority of states that haven't adopted a statute that allows for that process. Um, evictions, uh, you know, you get one on your record, it's a public record, that can impact negatively your ability to rent something in the future. Um, until recently, there was nothing that could be done about this, and it's, this isn't an all-encompassing statute, it's really limited in scope, uh, but as of July 1st of last year, you can actually petition to have an eviction expunged from your record, kind of like a criminal conviction, uh, but it's only available if the eviction uh, was filed, but not ultimately granted. So, hey, I'm in the eviction situation, there's a court record of it, we work it out, but I still have that court record that someone sought an eviction against me, um, then there are uh, forms and a procedure by which you can actually have that expunged. Now, if that eviction order was granted uh, and you were forced to be, uh, remove yourself from the property, then this would not apply to you, unfortunately. Uh, <coughs> oh, a question? Sorry, I have a lot of questions. Oh, you're good. I appreciate it. So with expungement, is there a time frame for when you can seek that? Because I know for like felonies and things, usually it's about five years. Yeah, yeah, Ms. Ms. Mears 5, Felony 7. Um, I did not see an, a, an actual waiting period for the eviction um, expungement. And now in Indiana, on criminal expungement, uh, conviction or conviction expungements, um, you get one in your lifetime, so you get one crack at it. I had the question, is that the case for eviction expungements or not? It didn't say in the statute that I read, um, so that's something just to satisfy my own curiosity I was going to look at, but I did not see a waiting period. Yes? What if they file the eviction, but the judge throws the eviction out and determines that it's not a viable thing? They say they owe the rent, and yep. the judge says they didn't owe rent. Mm -hmm. and you want something different entirely, then what? Will you still have an eviction on your record? The eviction would not be on your record, but the fact that there is a case that someone sought an eviction against you would exist, and that's when the expungement would come into play. Okay. Yep, good question. Can, can a tenant, like, um, petition the court to maybe, like, sue the landlord because they keep renting to um, certain type of people that make the living conditions unsafe for the other tenants? Well, I, we talked about earlier, the, the landlord has an obligation uh, to provide you a, a dwelling unit that you can peacefully enjoy. Uh, and so if a landlord is consciously uh, renting out to people that he has a reasonable belief will interfere with that right, there, there may be a, a legal avenue for that. It would be kind of an odd procedural petition to file. I'm not saying it's impossible. Uh, I've never seen it. Uh, the last topic, I believe, is foreclosures. Um, so just a couple terms, you know, the mortgagor is the borrower, the mortgagee is the lender. Promissory note is kind of what it sounds like, it's a promise to pay. The mortgage, that's the bank security. So if you go through a foreclosure process, in order for the bank to get paid back, they take the property, it goes through a sheriff's sale. Um, the acceleration clause is important because you miss a payment, they can accelerate everything that's due and owing uh, and file that foreclosure action. Um, same thing with the due on sale clause. <clears throat> Uh, personal money judgment versus an in-rim judgment. Um, this is important because if you are being sued as a defendant in a foreclosure, you will want to know if they're seeking a personal money judgment against you, they being the bank. Um, so if that's the case, and usually it is, um, once the property goes through sheriff sale, if you owe $100,000 to the bank and it sells for 80, then the bank still has a judgment against you for the deficiency and can pursue that. In rem just means against the property. Um, and so let's say you get a bankruptcy discharge, you reaffirm the house, they foreclose on it later, um, they would only pursue that interim judgment against the property and not you personally. Um, I also wanted to point out that the judgment in a foreclosure can't be had until three months after the date of a filing of a complaint. So this allows you a period of time with which to try to uh, work out an agreement with the bank and we're going to talk about that a little bit further. Also wanted to know, there's a pre-suit notice, kind of like the landlord has to give you 10 days notice before the eviction. Uh, not later than 30 days before a foreclosure action is filed, um, the bank has to send a notice to the debtor that tells them a few things. Number one, you're in default. <clears throat> Two, uh, you are encouraged to obtain assistance from a mortgage foreclosure counselor. Uh, and three, if a judgment is obtained, the debtor may still redeem the real estate and retain possession. Did, I'm sorry, did you say that the landlord 
landlord has to give a 10-day notice yes. to the tenant before they file an eviction? Correct. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, I also wanted to point out, um, I won't read all this, but basically <clears throat> if a foreclosure action is filed against you, and, and I, I was just doing this on behalf of the bank last week and I got this question from the debtor uh, in the hearing and he said, uh, if this foreclosure is granted today, do I have to get out today? Uh, I said, no, you don't. And he said, well, how long do I have? Well, the answer is until the sheriff sale occurs and that can take some time. Um, so he's gonna sit in this house and actually says in the statute, rent free, uh, until that sheriff's sale occurs. Uh, and we'll walk through that a little bit more in a moment, but I, I see people uh, from time to time, they think once that order issues, they have to really hustle and get everything out of the premises and move out. Um, if you're the debtor in that situation, my bank client wouldn't like me saying this, but you don't have to do that. So take your time, gather your stuff, and find an appropriate alternative uh, place for yourself to live. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to point it out because it's possible, usually not viable, but you can redeem the property prior to the sheriff's sale. So, um, you know, if you end up having a large cash windfall and the court's already issued an order of foreclosure, you still have the ability to say, mm, tell me how much I owe, and if I have it, I can pay it off, uh, and then all of that is rescinded, uh, and then your mortgage is reinstated. <clears throat> Uh, did one of these last week too, settlement conference on behalf of the debtor. So uh, there's a code section that says you can request a settlement conference with the court within 30 days. The bank has to assign a representative with authority uh, to uh, explore a foreclosure prevention agreement. And so there's different things that you can do um, to try to get out of that foreclosure scenario. Um, you can ask for a temporary forbearance, uh, a reduction of any arrearage, a reduction of the interest rate. Um, so you could actually modify that. Um, you can do a repayment plan, and that's usually where I find myself with the banks. Believe it or not, they don't want to foreclose on people. Um, it's a financial detriment to them. They want to help you figure it out so that you can pay off that note uh, all the way through to completion. Um, a deed in lieu of foreclosure, those are, are fairly frequent. If there's not a lot of judgments um, that have attached to the property, or any in fact, um, then the bank can say, all right, we won't foreclose, which is a judgment on your record, which negatively impacts your credit, we'll do a deed in lieu of foreclosure. So you deed us your interest to the bank, uh, and then we don't have to foreclose because we got it by simply having you execute that deed. This was a modifi modification agreement uh, that I did, and so the, the, real simple. I mean, we worked it out, we adjusted the interest rate, um, the debtor had time to catch up the missed payments, um, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, this was caught up and has been paying fine for the last three or four years. So uh, banks have an interest uh, to try to make these things work. So keep that in mind if you find yourself in that situation. <clears throat> uh, nearing the end here, but I wanted to talk about real estate contracts because as lawyers, we do a lot of those. Uh, it, it's a promise to purchase it uh, pursuant to a, a certain uh, purchase price over a certain term according to a certain interest rate. A lot of times we'll have balloon payments, so it'll say, hey, you're going to pay this for three years, uh, but then on this date, um, the full amount is going to become due and owing, and so at that point, the contract buyer has to go out and get a mortgage, but that allows them some time to kind of get their financial affairs in order to hopefully qualify when that time comes. Um, also, pay attention to the uh, foreclosure threshold percent percentage. Uh, if there's not one in your real estate contract, Indiana, there's a case called Skinzel, and it's kind of around the 20% mark. And so I I'm going to talk about that more because it's a little bit confusing. It's foreclosure versus rescission. Um, foreclosures are more involved in lengthy process. So if I'm selling you a house on contract and you don't make payments, um, and I have to go through the foreclosure process, well now there are the timelines, there are the protections built in for the buyer, um, and you're gonna have a better chance uh, of reinstating that in that context than you would in a rescission. So uh, if it's a rescission action, <clears throat> then process is uh, quicker. Uh, and you don't have those built-in protections. And so the way that they look at that, your contract hopefully addresses it. And if it says, at the point in time that the debtor reaches 20% equity in the home, uh, then the seller will have to go through foreclosure. So Indiana law is recognizing, you've built some equity in this, um, and you have some interest in this now, and so you're gonna get those foreclosure protections. If you're under that threshold, then it's a lot easier uh, for the seller <clears throat> uh, to rescind that and take the property back. Um, obviously, you wanna negotiate that if you're negotiating the contract in a manner that's most favorable to you, uh, but I've seen them where they're silent, and then we're relying on the case law to argue what is reasonable, can we do foreclosure, or can we do rescission? So something to keep in mind as you're uh, negotiating those.
Uh, so that timed out pretty well. Concludes it. Any questions about anything we've discussed or otherwise? <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, back to when the landlord shuts off utilities. Mm -hmm. That happens more than I think anybody would know. Yep. Um, how do they fix that? What, what, can they, what can a tenant do that's obviously not able to pay the rent or whatever? How, how can they get that fixed? I would start with the utility company first. Okay. Um, and I, I routinely advise when those questions come up um, to um, city utilities <clears throat> that that's something you cannot do. You need a judicial order before that happens. Next step, last step, would be through a court process. Uh, but I think the most pragmatic way is to reach out to the water company and say, uh, hey, here's this code section. Go look it up. I'm still in here. You can't do that. Yeah. And that's even if the utilities are in the landlord's name? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and then the other question I had was about supply and appliances. How long do they have to fix that problem after they're notified? Statue doesn't say. I mean, again, I think it's probably a reasonable misanalysis <clears throat> in that regard, um, and it depends on what the appliance is. You know, if, if we're trying to fix um, a, a heater that supplies heat to the house, well, and it's the winter time, we need to move pretty quickly. Um, but if it's AC and it's November, you know, you're going to have more of a cushion there. Um, but the, but if keep in mind that has to be. Uh, set forth within the lease agreement <coughs> and an inducement to get you to enter into the lease, which if it exists in the lease agreement, I think we can reasonably assume that it is, uh, but then it becomes the landlord's obligation <coughs> for those, ty those types of appliances. Fixtures and other things would be a, a different analysis when I'm talking about heat. Yeah. And are you willing to share your slides? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So if you want to send them to me, and if anybody wants his slides, my card's by the door, feel free to email me and I can send them on to you, if that would be okay with you. Yeah, okay. uh -huh. no problem. Yeah. So I... When I saw it in an evictions court, they, when they asked about the 10-day notice, mm -hmm. the judge often said it should be in your eviction packet. So does that mean when they give them the paperwork, that serves as their 10-day notice and their eviction? Because they often say they file it on the same time, and I get confused with that. I don't, does, does the court give out a 10-day notice to people that. when they file? Yeah. yeah. The 10-day notice is usually closer to given to the tenant ahead of time. Okay. That's what I do. I don't know. But you have, when you file eviction, you have to provide a copy of that to the courts for proof that you gave it. There you go. And yeah. so you provide a copy for the courts and the courts. Uh, okay. Statute says if the, if the rent is payable in advance, there's, that you're not, the landlord is not required to give a 10-day notice. Right, yeah, I'm glad that you pointed that out. So oh, if, if the rent is due on the 1st of August and it's for the month of August, then there's not a need for a 10-day notice. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good point. <clears throat> As just a matter of course, I always do it, but yeah, that's right. Yeah, I always do it too. Sorry, Agent, can you just repeat that? Can you get a little mic, what you just said? If, if rent is payable in advance, then the 10 day notice is not required. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, thank you. I will turn it over to Keon. Well, uh, once again, my name is Keon Jackson. I'm the executive director and CEO for the Richmond Housing Authority. I don't have a fancy slideshow, so. But I'm going to touch on everything that AJ mentioned because he's on the attorney side of things and I'm on the housing landlord side of things for the housing authority. So um, I just want to point out one thing. This is our attorney for the housing authority here, uh, Kurt Whitehart. So um, he can clarify some things if uh, need be here. Um, so uh, one thing I want to point out to you guys is we offer um, low-income public housing. Uh, we have a voucher program as well with uh, 277 vouchers. And for our public housing, we have uh, 304 public housing units. And what that means is we are the landlords of those 304 public housing units. And so we own and operate four developments around the city of, city of Richmond. And we also have 12 single family homes in the city of Richmond as well. Um, but we have that uh, managed out with the management company. And sometimes they are market rate, or sometimes they are voucher holders in those uh, 12 units, okay? Um, I put over there a frequently asked question sheet. Um, you guys can just pick one up and it should answer a lot of the questions that people may have. Um, some of the misconceptions of housing, I want to point some of those out as well. Um, sometimes we get a bad rap, I understand. Um, but the clientele that we deal with, um, we, are, we do deal with low income housing individuals. We also deal with uh, mental, um, disability individuals and that, like Kurt, I'm not Kurt, <laughs> I think Kurt, like AJ pointed out, um, a lot of times uh, we have to worry about the fair housing and ADA um, rules. And so 
A lot of things that we do, since we're federally funded, we have to abide by a lot of those rules. And so everything that he pointed out, I just want to touch on everything from the housing authority side of things as being a landlord. Again, private landlord versus um, private landlord, which are the Section 8 vouchers, versus a public housing authority, federally assisted, federally funded, is different because, again, we must, we must, we can't just say we may be able to fix up. We must fix things in a reasonable time frame for our residents. <clears throat> now, don't get me wrong, sometimes things don't get fixed. Sometimes the residents won't allow us to fix things, but we're responsible for fixing things. Now, I know we talked about uh, sometimes infestations. We talked about um, poor, poor, let's see, something ain't working, whatever, refrigerated stove. We're required to fix those things. Now, when we rent out an apartment, rent out a house, rent out whatever it may be, we don't put infestation in top, inside of the units, right? We don't put roaches, we don't put mice, we don't put these things inside of the unit. However, we have to fix it. We have to make sure it is abated because we're responsible for that. Now, a resident will tell you that we ain't did anything to fix something. That's totally false. You know, her can tell you, your agent can tell you, a lot of people can tell you that we've done everything that we can um, in any situation when it comes to. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'll give it to you. That's okay. Are you hearing me okay? Okay. Yeah. We do everything that we can and everything in our power to get rid of rodents, infestation, insects, even you know little bees and anything that, that may be. So we're doing everything in our power to get rid of these things. And so, yes, you're going to hear the complaints that we're not doing anything on our side of things, but that's totally false in most cases. Now, I will tell you guys this, all right? There's some things that slip through the cracks like anywhere else. There's things that slip through. We can't fix everything every minute. However, if they get reported to us, we're required to fix it. A lot of times people don't report it to us because they, they fear that they're going to be evicted or they fear that they're going to get charged for it. Sometimes it may be the case, as he was pointing out, normal wear and tear versus extreme damages, big difference. We can't charge people for normal wear and tear when they leave a unit. But if it's extreme damages, then yes, we can charge them. But like he said, it has to be itemized. We have to have <clears throat> photo evidence of everything that's going on. So documentation is important. You know, the two attorneys would like to say, you know, the founders of evidence, you got to have the documentation, right? Evidence, evidence, evidence. And that's how we have to operate. And so we have to document everything. Now, a lot of cases, people are calling in, they make complaints about something. But we say, hey, you know, work orders are one thing, but if you call in and complain about other things, you need to put it in writing because it's a, it's a he say, she say type of situation. And so I'm going off topic now. Um, you guys talked about uh, security deposits. So yes, we offer security deposits. Uh, most security deposits, um, we went to a flat security deposit, meaning one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom, five bedroom, it's a flat rate for each one. So one bedroom is, let's say $100, two bedrooms, $200. I'm not saying that's the number, but we went to a flat rate. It makes it a whole lot easier. It makes it simpler for everyone. Instead of having, you know, $300 here, $400 here, $600 here, you know, it makes it a whole lot easier. And again, we're dealing with low-income individuals as well, right? And so if you look on the, the frequently asked questions, they tell you what the income limits are for what, what classifies as low-income low individuals. And so you guys look at that and, and just determine who qualifies and who doesn't qualify. Um, as far as security deposits, we offer repayment agreements. You know, sometimes people can't get a home because they can't afford the $100, $200, so we be out for a repayment agreement, you know? We do our best to try to get people into housing. We do our best to screen people into our housing. Yes, some people will be, will be denied based on certain things, but I can't, you know, everyone is, only thing you can't come in to housing on is, is you were convicted of, um, convicting of, uh, meta, uh, how you say this? Methamphetamines. How you say that? Methamphetamines. There you go. Methamphetamines. That's if you convicted of producing methamphetamines in housing development, or if you uh, are a child of uh, sexual child offender, sexual sexual predator. That's the only time you can't come into our housing developments. And that's HUD law. It's not a Indiana law. It's not a, a Richmond law. It's HUD. It's a federal law. 
What about if the uh, proposed tenant owes money to uh, to a HUD unit previously? They just have to pay it back. They just, they they just have to pay it back before they can come in. Back, you cannot come in until you pay it back to whoever organization, whatever federally funded organization that you owe the money to. Yes, ma'am. Um, he did ask a question about um, people with addictions or mental health issues, and that classifies as like a disability under the A. The ADA? Like, that, that's an attorney. You gotta act, but does, however. Go ahead. Hmm? Does that, that can affect the um, safe and, and safe living environment for the other tenants? So. And so that depends on. For people like that. And see, again, so if somebody has a disability, we're not allowed to ask what that disability is. If they have, only thing we can ask for is the documentation from the doctor. We can't ask what it is. We can't ask. Side effects, we can't ask, we can't, we can't. How do you screen people though for like placing them in different housing areas though? So we have, uh, what we do is we run criminal background checks and then we also um, look at past rental history like AJ was uh, saying earlier, we look at past history. Now, again, this is low income housing, so I'm not asking you, your credit score to be a thousand. You know, I'm, I'm asking, I'm not asking for the most. I'm asking for, again, show that you can pay your rent on time, you can get utilities in your name, and that you have, you know, minimum to no criminal history. Now, criminal history does not bar you automatically from getting into one of our units. Every case is different. It's a case by case basis. You have two people, both have the same crime. One person has went to rehab or went to court appointed treatments and did everything in the right way and has a caseworker who's vouching for them and the other person has not done anything. I'm, we're gonna allow this person in based on all that stuff. We're gonna allow the person in because that's just how it is. You know, this person has a chance of succeeding in our housing versus this person over here who's just, just not, not even trying, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I just didn't know because I know that there's different areas mm -hmm. here in Richmond. There's like, I think it's called, I don't know if it's still called this, but it was Westwood Apartments mm -hmm. and then there was, um, I think that's called Norwood Apartments mm -hmm. on the north mm -hmm. side. How do you guys usually screen people and choose where to place different families at? So, so good question. Um, so what that is is again, those are family developments. Mm -hmm. So we have a senior dis we have a senior disabled um, development. We have and then we have three family developments, which is Jerry Geyer Westwood, Bobby Smith Norwood. These are one and the same. And then we have um, uh, Southview Mays Manor. Those are our three family developments, and those are all townhomes. The only single occupancy we have is Merrill Henderson, and that's over on uh, South 81 South 14th Street. All the other ones are family developments, and again, it's based on your wait list. It's based on your application. It's based on what you qualify for. Person? How yes, ma'am. How long is the wait list? Okay. So is there a different wait list for senior disabled versus family then? Uh, there is not. However, you, you don't qualify. Senior disabled, you may not qualify for the same thing as a family because you may have children, multiple ages, depending on. Um, but however, um, the wait list, there's no difference as far as the wait list because you got, that's, a one, that's only a one bedroom, zero to one bedroom at the um, senior disabled building versus the family sites are all two, three, four bedrooms. So, like, if, if, if it's a senior disabled person, or not even just a disabled person, mm -hmm. they, they all have access to, like, elevators and stuff like that? Yes, ma'am. That goes back to the ADA, um, the ADA fair, fair housing requirement. Um, we are required um, by law HUD requirements to 5% of our, 5 of our total units have to be ADA accessible. Now, sometimes we have more, sometimes we have, depending on the modifications that we may have to make, but at the minimum, 5% has to be ADA accessibility. Yes, ma'am. Um, I thought you didn't qualify for HUD if you have an eviction on your record, or is it only for HUD homes if you get an eviction there? Uh, that's not necessarily true. Um, it depends. Um, and again, like I was mentioning earlier, if you, you, you had an eviction, but yet you went to classes, you did all this stuff, you, you working with people to get your credit score or you get your stuff back in, 
I'll choose you versus someone else with the same situation. So every case is different. It's a case by case thing. Yes, ma'am. Question about the Section 8 voucher mm -hmm. program. Um, with that, uh, you are you guys still the landlord in that, or is it a private landlord? Does he still have, or is he or she still have to follow those regulations that you guys do with that program? That's a good question. Um, we are not the landlords of the Section 8 voucher program. However, we go into a contract with the um, landlord. It's a contract between the landlord, the housing authority, and the housing and urban development. So, it, so they, they're required, a lot of those things they're required to do as well. And if they're not doing it, then we can, you know, pull the money from them. And then we can actually tell them, when I say pull the money, meaning we don't pay them until they fix the corrections that need to be done. However, however, in most cases, people don't report this stuff sometimes. And so, but we have a right to say, hey, we're holding your, we're holding your, you know, disbursement your your check deposit, whatever it may be, based on whatever's going on with the resident. But the tenant though never has a right to withhold rent from the landlord in the state of Indiana for any reason. Nope. So this would be a different scenario. Mm -hmm. He's talking about with section eight, but outside of the scope of that context, yeah, there's, there's no way. <laughs> and you got to understand. The Housing Choice Voucher Program, those are private landlords. And so it's different than the, the stuff that we have to do. They can, they can give them what, they can, they can kick them out for a lot of different things that we can. It's so much harder on our side, on the public housing side, to say, hey, you know, person is doing this, that, and the other. It just takes a lot more time on, on our end than it does with the, I don't know how long it takes for the, um, the public, I mean, not the public housing, the Housing Choice Voucher side, the landlords. But they still have, they have a contract and they have to abide by, you know, HQS, which is uh, housing quality standards as well, when they enter into that contract. Any other questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, one of the things when we're talking about occupancy, someone, uh, someone asked about waiting lists and occupancy. Um, and Keon sort of touched on it. One of the problems we have is that the, our, our folks who might start out filling out their paperwork online or in person in the paper, we can do it either way, they just don't finish or, or we can't find them to follow up, do the follow-ups. So if sometimes we have vacancies, it isn't because we don't want the people. Hmm. It's because one of the reasons, and I know that because I was a community in schools person at STAR for six years, and it, it's the same you know, sort of population and they don't follow through, which is why you need a CLS person and every school to follow through. So for the kids, and mm -hmm. I do that, but we can't make people finish their applications or come up with the items that they need to come up with. And I would say the new online thing, which we have because of this man, is uh, fantastic. So it, it is acceptable and we have people downtown who are or at our place, which is basically down now, who will help if, you, if the person needs help. They, mm -hmm. um, often our folks, for a variety of reasons, which is the thing I saw um, at my job, was that something stops them. There's a part of their life that stops them and they don't finish through and then they could have gotten a place. That's kind of on them. Mm -hmm. So uh, you sort of touched on, there's complaints, there's this, well, just finish your application. Well, I, I'll do you one better. This week we had, we had 30, <laughs> 30 individuals that were supposed to come in to do a briefing, meaning we've called them, we've pulled their name to come in and get housed. They're supposed to come in and meet with the public housing director. Out of those 30 people that came in, six came in this week. Six out of 30 came in. I mean, we've pulled them, they, they, they filled out the application already. We pulled them to come in to finish the paperwork and everything that they needed to finish, and only six showed up out of 30. Now, again, we can't make people come in. You know, our list remains open. The list is open. We have housing opportunities. Um, it may take up to 30 days to process the application, but however, once we do process it and we call the people in to come in and fill out the paperwork or come in to meet and provide the information, it's information that you have to bring in. It's birth certificates, social security cards, you know, proof of income, whatever it may be. But 30 versus six. I know sometimes it's hard to get that information in, um, but that's what you know, we're trying to, we're gonna be working on you know, getting the resources together. Um, 
I also want to point out Lindsay in the crowd too. She's our family sufficiency coordinator. So she's working with those individuals, helping them get those stuff, and helping them get those things together in a lot of cases. I had a question. Once, like, once a person um, qualifies for a Section 8, mm -hmm. and is it the uh, person's responsibility to find a Section 8 landlord, or does the housing authority find a Section 8 suitable landlord for that tenant? I would say yes on both because it's, it's the person's responsibility to find their own housing. However, we have a list of landlords that are already currently um, administering vouchers and who have a good success that we point them in a direction. Now, we can't force anybody to go anywhere so they can find their own house. But it's their responsibility. We just try to help them as best as we can. And is there a time period that they have to find housing? 90 days. 90 days they have 90 to days an to find an apartment. Once they are issued a voucher, they have 90 days. Now, sometimes we extend the vouchers um, for you know, 30 to 60 days, depending on situations. Typically, we don't want to do that, but we will because, again, we understand around Richmond there is not a lot of housing opportunities. So we're trying to do the best that we can to give them success. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. I, no, no, you're fine. So if somebody like has zero income, like they're waiting on their SSI or SSD, mm -hmm. um, how does that work with, I mean, how would they be able to pay rent or pay the deposit or anything like that? So, <clears throat> so when you come in and do, your, when we call you in, do your intake, all that stuff, you bring that information in. You may not have it yet, but you may have the letter saying you're going to be getting it, or you may have, you may know you're going to get it. It's all calculated. So you pay your rent based on your income. And your income would be, it'd either be 30% of your gross income, or it'd be a flat rent. I'll be, it'd be 10% or something. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but you know, that's not my forte, but it's one of the two. Is there, it is possible. Yes, yes, yes. It's all based on your income. So. You, you, won't never pay, you will never pay more than 30% of your gross income. You will never pay more when you're in housing. So if your name comes up and you still don't have like the income coming in, is there like a minimum threshold of how much you need to be making in order to actually enter into housing with the housing authority? Yep. Or? Right here on this paper at least. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, they are. Um, so for public housing and for the Housing Choice Voucher Program, the income limits are on here. And it, has, it goes by individual size, family size. So if it's one person, two person, three persons, so on, it goes by that size. So it has your minimum income limits on both programs here. The only thing, I want to point out a couple of things in case you guys take this home and think that I'm, so one thing is the approval. Um, so once you get approved, you'll be notified to view an apartment. Um, other one is it takes up to 30 days to process application. And the other one is um, depending on the HACR development, um, we're determining what utilities you would pay. Those are the only three updates that I have for that slide right now, for that um, frequently asked questions. So you said that the wait time varies, but I've heard it takes like sometimes over two years for people to get into housing. Is that correct? That is not correct on the public housing side. Now on the housing choice voucher side, that's possible because again, you got to understand the housing choice voucher you know, you can, that's like a golden ticket a lot of times because you can use that and go anywhere in the country, not just here in Richmond. But you have to stay in Richmond for at least that first year. And then you can go anywhere. You can, uh, you can port it out to any, any city that has housing that will accept you to come in. So a lot of people don't really come off of that program unless they either, God forbid, they pass away, um, they, want to, they, they, they make too much money, or they just want to be done with the program or they get terminated for illegal stuff. That happens a lot. So let me take that back. That does happen very often. Um, if there's no escrow service in this county, then what else is there? Like, well, well, <clears throat> well, I don't know what else there is as far as escrow goes. However, on, on, I'm, I'm speaking as a housing authority, not as a private landlord, as a housing authority, um, we do everything in our power to accommodate whatever, you know, people may not think so, but as far as if you have an issue and you think we're not fixing the issue and it's our issue, it's our problem, and we've caused you some kind of harm or some kind of, um, you know, discomfort or, you know, loss of food or whatever it may be, 
you know, I always take that into consideration. You know, sometimes I may, I may reimburse you if you if we let the refrigerator and your food spoil before, you know, if we don't come out there right away and take care of it. Now, a situation he was mentioning about the heat, um, wintertime, we have 24 hours to fix it. You know, we don't have, you know, days. It has to be done in 24 hours. Whether it be heat, whether it be hot water, that's 24 hours. Um, depends, like he said, now if it happens in the, in the summertime, heat is not going to be an emergency because you don't need heat in the summer as much as you need it in the wintertime. So it's not considered an emergency. Now, let's say you say that we haven't repaired something. We haven't repaired this hole in your wall. It's been two months and you want to hold your rent back. You know, I wouldn't recommend that. However, I would do everything in my power. We would do everything in our power as an agency to get it taken care of. Now, again, we can't make everybody happy. I understand that, but we try our best to make repairs. We try our best to provide the customer service that we need, that you guys, well, that the residents may need. You know, I don't want to say that we, we don't do everything perfect. I can tell you that right now. However, we try, you know, since I've been here, we've been trying. A lot of the housing that we have, it was, it was in bad shape when I got here. And we've, I think we've turned over about 80, 80 or so um, apartments since I've been here. Um, and again, we modernized those apartments. You know, we update the fixtures, update the floor, and update the utilities, light fixtures. We do all that stuff. I'm not the appliances and light fixtures and all that thing. So we're trying to modernize um, the public housing and make it so that people would want to be in these homes and take care of these homes, you know. I understand that sometimes, you know, people are not going people are just going to do what they want to do sometimes. They're not going to take care of the places and that's on us to enforce our leases, which is why we've redone our leases. We've we've done a lot of things to make sure that we are doing the right things on our end so we can enforce more things criminal wise, uh, not following rules wise. And it just takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Because the problems didn't happen overnight either. It happened over time, you know. And I've been telling everybody who will listen that we're changing the face here in Richmond of public housing. Yes, we've had some things happen recently, but again, that can happen anywhere. It just for, it, unfortunately that it happened here. You know, I feel bad that those things happen, but at the same time, you know, we have to move past that. We're not law enforcement. I just want to point that out to everybody. Our agency is not law enforcement. You have to call the police if there's something criminal going on, if things happen. You know, we're not an assisted living facility either. You know, people who live there voluntarily. People who live there because they need to live there. People who live there because they have nowhere else to live. So we can't force people to stay. I mean, we can't force people to go into assisted living or we can't nursing homes or things like that. Now, their family may be able to do that, but we can't do that as a housing agency. All right, so those are the things that I wanted to point out to you guys, you know, and again, we don't have emergency housing. If it, we don't have emergency housing, we have options. We don't have emergency housing though. Yes, ma'am. Um, I actually have a question for you. So code enforcement at no time came up in your presentation. Let's say I'm a tenant and I have a massive hole in my floor mm -hmm. and I talk to the landlord about Fixing that, they haven't done anything. Kind of what, what steps should I as a tenant take to kind of bring this along? And um, also, like, my understanding too, there's a lot of folks in town that are concerned about making reports about like, uh, code enforcement violations for fear of like getting blacklisted from other housing. So, like, what, what kind of legal rights might someone have in those cases too? Well, the there was a slide that talked about the warranty of habitability and one of the prongs of that is that all local and state codes uh, are complied with and so that's where and I, I could have delved further so it's a, a good question that's where code enforcement can come in so if you believe that the landlord uh, is violating local code uh, then my suggestion would be to reach out to the office of code enforcement and their house here in the city building and they will go out and investigate that they have the ability uh, to issue fines if those fines are paid um, then it comes to me and then I can file a judicial action to try to recover those um, and uh, there, there's also the ability to seek even injunctive relief hey 
court, this is such a pervasive and palpable problem that we need not only monetary fines to try to spur some uh, remedial efforts, but we need a judge to sign off and say, you will fix this because it's a health and safety hazard. How often does it get to that, though? Does it sound like, from talking to social service providers, yeah. it seems like there's a lot of violations and maybe code enforcement doesn't mm -hmm. have the teeth in I think that it has the teeth that it needs. The problem uh, is that I, I guess if you sought um, that type of uh, injunctive relief on every single problem, then you'd probably have to expand that department times 10 and you'd have to expand mine in an in equal manner probably. Um, wish we had resources to do that for every single uh, p violation. Um, if we did, then maybe it would look different, but I can tell you they do their level best to identify and then enforce the code violations. Um, there was a, a second part to your question, which is if I report that, do I get blacklisted? I, I would adamantly say that that's not happening. Now, maybe if a landlord finds out and there's like a, a, a secret society where they get together and they talk about who makes reports, I have no control over that. Um, but certainly from the government's perspective, that information is not shared um, with other potential landlords. Can I touch on that one, one piece of that? Um, one thing about that um, is we talked about um, <laughs> if someone reports something. So we've had the health department called on us. You know, we've had things like that happen. But again, like I was telling you guys before, we don't bring these problems in. When they first moved there, those problems don't exist. And so, but however, we try our best to get rid of these issues. You know, whether it be, like I told you guys before, we gotta have the evidence, we gotta have the paperwork. And I can point out, you know, we have pest control monthly, weekly, you know. So that's one issue. They can't say that we're not trying to get rid of things. If it's identified that somebody has a major infestation, it gets taken care of, you know. Now, it's also up to the residents or the tenants, whoever you may want to look at. You guys have to housekeeping, you know. Those are, that's a major issue in a lot of places where, when it comes to, if you're talking about infestation, you talk even mold, you know. Mold sometimes is because, you know, and God forbid, it's a cleaning issue sometimes. It's not just, you know, people also say black mold is that, it's a cleaning issue a lot of times. Or it's a ventilation issue where you're just letting a fan not run in there when you're taking a shower. You just got the hot water running and steam just going everywhere. Over time, that builds up and it's, it's going to present mold because it, that's just what it does. Now, again, sometimes residents don't let us in to fix things either because either they got unauthorized pets in, they don't want us to find out about, they don't want us to see the the way that the unit is in disrepair a lot of times. And so once we find these things out, they think that they're going to get in trouble. Yeah, they will based on their lease. However, it's our responsibility to fix these things. And then they want to go and, again, report us to somewhere when we not, they're not giving us the opportunity to fix these things. I can guarantee you this. If someone says that we're not trying to fix things or we are not you know, doing our best to try to do things, I, I would say I disagree adamantly because again, you know, since I've been here, you know, I've seen the worst, and so I know what it looks like, and I know, you know, how it operates. But again, we're trying to change the face. We're trying to change these things, and that means giving us the opportunity to actually fix these things. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Can I take thirty seconds to tell folks about FSS? Oh, I don't know. Can she? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Sure. If you want to go up and you can put the mic on. Oh, that's great. Um, you want to sit? I'm good, probably. <laughs> Let's just see how to put this thing on without breaking it. You see the blue light facing up? It's a clip. I might just hold it. You can hold it. If that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about the housing authority. Richmond has not had a family self-sufficiency program before. Um, that's a program run through the Housing Authority. I've been hired to build it and make it happen. That's sponsored by HUD. It's entirely federally funded and they exist all over the country. Um, and now Richmond has one, which is really exciting because it means that if you are a resident of public housing provided by the Housing Authority, or if you receive one of our Section 8 vouchers, you can receive social services, referrals, case management, assistance with pretty much any issue you've got going on through me um, and through the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. So what that means is that I've talked to a lot of folks in here already about social services and I'm partnering with 
all of the fabulous organizations that are already doing that in Richmond to provide those services. Um, it also means that if you're a social service provider or a case manager and you want to talk to me afterwards, I would love to chat with you because I'm trying to meet everyone I can so I have all the information I need. Um, the program has a feature that is an escrow account. Um, if you are participating in the program, you're, anytime your income increases, corresponding money comes from HUD and goes right into that escrow account. You don't receive those funds immediately, but when you graduate from the program, the whole thing is paid out to you with a check. So there's free money involved, basically, is how I put it to clients, and there's case management involved, so those are the pros, and the cons are that you have to sign some paperwork and show up to a couple meetings. Um, so I'm in the process of doing outreach both with social service providers and our residents right now, and if you want to talk to me about helping me get the word out, I would also appreciate that. What constitutes as a family? Anyone over the age of 18 constitutes as a head of household. Those are the folks that sign the contracts. But if you're an individual, you're also eligible. Mm -hmm. Have you had conversations with the Department of Child Services about the program yet? That's a really good question. I have not. I don't know who our local representative is. Yeah, I, I can get you guys that information. But, that would be great. Uh, I, I, in those cases, I, we run into housing issues a lot. Mm -hmm. and, um, those particular types of cases not only have housing issues, but there's a, a, sometimes a litany of other issues that they need to work through. Absolutely. Those wraparound services you're talking about, I think they'd be highly interested in that. Yeah. What about the Family Together program that's one that's in Delaney's court? Oh yeah, the family, yeah. That that's similar, but without housing. So I think you probably ought to link up with the director of that program too. So that's, that's a good point. Yeah, I would love to like get an email address before we all walk out this door. Um, In order to qualify for the program you're talking about, does the person already have to be receiving the Section Eight or HUD program? Yes. So. Okay. The program is available to folks who receive specifically Housing Authority of the City of Richmond Section 8 vouchers. I know that ICAP is also able to provide those vouchers, and folks who receive ICAP vouchers cannot get on FSS with me, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, if you get a Section 8 voucher from the Housing Authority, or if you live in Housing Authority public housing, but you've already got to be a resident in order to participate in the program, yeah. Does that include the vouchers that ICAP has that are also in Richmond? Nah. Okay. So folks who receive those vouchers are not eligible for our FSS program. I would love to answer any more questions about this afterwards. Who do I give this to? You can just set it right there. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions for our presenters? I understand trailers are a nightmare of both worlds, in which I mean they own the trailer, but they rent the land. So what exactly does that, does that mean they go through official foreclosure or because they own the land, are they like regular residents as far as they get evicted? You want to answer that? I mean, <laughs> we don't have to. I've, I've I'm going to ask you too. I, I've never had to file a foreclosure action in that particular circumstance. So uh, I don't know. Have you ever done that? I mean, foreclosure? No. On a, eviction? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where you'd probably end up is the eviction because they are movable. Okay, just moved up to the land? Yeah. They, well, there's, but there's not many people that know how to move mobile homes anymore. Mm. And they're not very cheap. Mm. Uh, there's, there's less and less mobile home parks. When I moved to Richmond 30 years ago, there was a number of mobile home parks. Uh, and there used to be, I think there's still is a lot that says that the uh, if you owe lot rent, that becomes a lien against the trailer. Wow. And you can't move the trailer until you pay the lot rent. That so makes sense. It's really kind of a double whammy. Yeah, and they don't have to fix things because it's technically a it's, yeah, ownership thing. Correct. The, the, uh, the park does not own the home, usually, right. sometimes, but usually not. So if you're behind in your rent, they can require you to remove your home. It's an interesting question. Just for future reference, being affiliated with the foundation, you're supposed to toss up like real softball questions. <laughs> 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 Not those kind. <laughs> it's fine. Next time, ask me off camera. Will you? <laughs> I'm still a law student. Let me learn. All right. Any other questions? Another question. Uh, so I'm a psychology student. I think we've met. We did. Four hands out of the right across from Merlin's door. 
Um, and I really uh, remember what you said about leases and how you were doing the leases. And I know you mentioned something about mental health, but I was kind of in the, you know, I was in the zone. So I was wondering if the Housing Authority contracts mental health services the intro Merle Henderson, or that's individually based. <clears throat> we don't we don't con we don't contract any services out. However, um, we are in process of trying to partner with Meridian and Centerstone to provide services there on a regular basis because a number of our um, residents do have um, contacts or caseworkers with those two um, those two centers. So we're trying, but we're trying to have a better partnership where we can get services there more frequently to those individuals who may need it and don't have it, and then the ones who do have it already, just more frequently, frequent visits, so. Do you think it would be unethical if you partnered with someone like the, the FSA to put like a, I don't know, mentor tracking thing into the lease where they can be like, hey, I want to sign this where I have assistance to take me to where I need to go, where someone is tracking whether I'm actually going to these appointments or I'm meeting with the people that I'm supposed to be meeting with, like some kind of mentor system in there that just kind of follows them to make sure they, they do it. It's like the military. So as a sergeant in the military, I had to track all my privates and everything they did. And if they didn't go to an appointment, I was called before they, like, they could tell me. So I was just wondering if you thought it was unethical or a possibility to include a mental health assistance mentor program inside the lease that would then help the residents not only like, go to their um, programs or assistance, but have someone that actually is there to be like, hey, you missed this. Why did you miss this? Mm -hmm. Is it unethical? I don't think it's unethical. However, um, we can't do that in our leases uh, because, again, federal funded program member. So we can only put so much in our lease. So that I don't know. I we can't put that in specific in our lease. However, we can try. Like I said, she's providing assistance to help them get all the services that they may need currently. I'm not saying she's going to get everyone and everybody. However, we're, we have options that we can try to get those services to them. I just can't put it in their lease because that I, I just can't put it in their lease. Hey, good try, though. Voluntary box check. Now, because her program is strictly voluntary, and so we can't require them to do it. They can sign up and then quit if they want, you know, but it's just beneficial for them to stay in it and get the services that they would need. It's strictly voluntary, and I kind of want to highlight that what you're describing is essentially kind of case management, right? Of like, you don't go to your appointment, I find out about it, I encourage you, you should go. What prevented you from going? Was it a transportation issue? Did you not get enough sleep last night because the neighbors were making too much noise? Is there something else I can help with in there? Um, so the family self-sufficiency coordinator, that's me, does kind of some of that work, but again, the participation in that program is totally voluntary. 